Okay, so what are the six ways that narcissists build a case against you? And especially in litigation. So number one, they trigger you. They trigger you because they want you to get emotional. They want you to do things, act in ways, say things, write things, because then they've got something that they can use against you, right? And I always say that dealing with a narcissist, especially in, a, in the course of a case, is like getting arrested. Anything you do or say will definitely be used against you. So be careful. And I also say that anything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit. So I'd always tell my clients back when I was practicing, I would say, you know, whenever you're getting ready to push send or post or whatever it is that you're about to do, just imagine the judge is like, but they're a little head like over your shoulder and going, hmm, you know, would you want that judge to see what you're about to, to write? Because you may see it again at a very inopportune time during cross-examination or a deposition or something like that. You just don't want to have to be seeing it again at an inopportune time. And let me tell you, I've had those situations happen to me as a lawyer. I had a client who was just so mad that he had to write a support check. Okay. And so he, without my knowledge, obviously decided to sign a support check with his left hand. He was right-handed. He signed it with his left hand. He signed it in crayon. He signed it just his first name, just to be funny. He thought he was like being Mr. Funny and sent it over to the wife. Well, of course, that becomes like the centerpiece of one of her cross-examination questions. Oh, did you send this over to the wife? Is this your signature? And of course, he ends up looking like a jackass in front of the judge. And what could I do? Nothing. I mean, because he did send it. Doesn't make him look very good, right? And judges under those robes are people too. So they end up making drawing conclusions about people, all right? So these are things that they do. Narcissists try to trigger you. Don't take that bait. Don't, don't allow them to do that. So number one is trigger you. Number two is they condition you from the beginning. They make you think that they're invincible. They love bomb you. Some, sometimes it's called the idealization phase. Whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, it always starts out the same way where they try to make themselves appear to be perfect for you. Like, where has this person been all my life? How wonderful are they? And so they condition you from the beginning and then it starts to go downhill from there. All of a sudden, they start devaluing you. They start gaslighting you. They start making you think that you're crazy. And then they make your thinking is wrong. So that makes your brain start wondering what's going on through the gaslighting, through all of that sort of crazy making, through the projection, the deflection, the lying, the denying, all of that. It's all created to try to destabilize you to try to make you think that you're crazy and at the same time control you. But also the conditioning is also meant to make you think that they are invincible, that they are smarter than anybody else, that they are always the winner, that they are so great. And so I can't tell you how many times that I have dealt with clients that think, oh my God, they are so smart. They are so, nobody could ever beat them. And you don't realize how much of your thinking is actually just their conditioning of you. They're actually not all that invincible, but that's what you think. That's part of how they start building a case against you from the beginning.
So that's number two. Number three is they start planting seeds also from the beginning. They start planting seeds with their flying monkeys, with their smear campaigns. They start making you think that everybody else thinks that this is the way things are going. Everybody else thinks that they're wonderful, that you're crazy, that everybody else is lined up with them. In some cases, they have started planting seeds early on, long ago. You do have to start to think about how you're going to shut down that narcissist smear campaign. And, you know, you can, to some extent, think about defamation actions and all that sort of thing. And But, you know, there are other ways to shut down a narcissist smear campaign as well. And I do have a whole video on how to shut down a narcissist smear campaign. And you can definitely check out my video on that topic and just shut them down. You know, put that in the comments right now. Shut them down. If you are so ready to shut them down, put that in the comments right now. Shut them down. It's time. Isn't it time? Don't you think it's time? I definitely think it's time. So another thing that they do is they they figure out what your weaknesses are by just being in relationship with you. How they start building a case against you is they've been in relationship with you. They know you, especially if they've been in a relationship with you, whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, if they've had any kind of a relationship with you at all, your weaknesses against you. I mean, they have no conscience. And once you're against them, so with the narcissist, you're either for them or against them. So once the, once they realize you're against them and the switch gets flipped and they'll just use anything that they've learned about you against you. So they'll use your weaknesses, whatever you've ever shared with them or whatever they know about you, they'll just use it against you, whatever it is. So they'll use your weaknesses against you. Number five is they keep track of things. They collect data. They keep track of information, photographs, whether it's emails or texts or whatever, they will keep track of information if they need to. They might keep recordings, videos, whatever they need to. They're very paranoid people. So they will keep track of information. So that's one way they will build a case against you as well. And number six, they will manipulate evidence and they will lie. They have no problem with that. They're liars. And so they will manipulate evidence and they will lie. When you are dealing with a narcissist and you are getting ready to go to court, you better look out. I am an attorney and I have seen it. I've been dealing with narcissists in court for more than 20 years. And I can tell you that when you're in a relationship with a narcissist, you are either for them or you are against them. And when you are in that discard phase of a relationship, they now go into you are the against them situation. It's now you are becoming public enemy number one. So now you're against them. So now gloves are off and they want to take you down. They want to take you down before you have a chance to take them down. So they want to make sure they get to you right away. Now, the first thing that you're going to see in this situation is they're going to act nice. They're going to act like they want to make this all amicable. Okay. So they're going to act like they want this to be all friendly and all nice and super good terms. Now, the thing that I'm going to say to you is that they have been liars the entire relationship. There is a reason why you don't want to be married to them anymore. I mean, people like they've not been telling you the truth the whole entire time. Why? Why would they start now all of a sudden being truthful to you now? They're not. I mean, I have literally had to have the come to Jesus conversation with my clients. And, you know, the clients just tend to be like, oh, why would my lawyer be telling me the truth? And I'm like, okay, well, I I've had to literally get out emails with my clients and say, 
I know your soon-to-be ex-husband is telling you this. Here's an email I got from his lawyer today, which is telling the opposite of what he's saying to you. It's so mind-blowing to me, but they say they want to be amicable, but they're doing that because they're trying to trick you into signing something. They're going to say, you know, you don't need a lawyer. We can do this on our own or something like that. But it's really just to try to trick you into signing something. Don't do it, people. Okay. They're going to try to get you to settle early. They're going to try to get between you and your lawyer because they don't want you to get a lawyer because they don't want this other person to have control over you. So they're going to say that your lawyer is bad. They're going to say that your lawyer is a shyster or your lawyer is too busy or that your lawyer is in some way not good because they don't want this other person to have control over you. So that's number one. Number two, when that doesn't work, then they start to play dirty. They're going to lie in the pleadings. You're going to get this petition and it's going to be like, wow, I can't believe they said all this stuff. Just don't, don't be shocked because it's just going to say all kinds of crap. Don't be shocked. It's going to say whatever it's going to say. Okay. You know, you're going to feel the need to go insane, but they literally will lie and say whatever they're going to say. They will lie right in court documents. They will. And they will ignore court orders too, by the way. Just blatantly ignore them. That happens. They just completely play dirty. Number three, number three, they will threaten you by saying things that are just totally false. They'll say things like that they're going to be able to take your kids away from you. They're going to say things that have no basis in fact or law. There have been so many times that I've had people come into my office and say like, I, you know, I'm afraid that I'm going to be out on the street or something like that, or that they're going to be able to take my house away from me. So many times these things have no basis in fact or law, but I'll tell you something. You really do need to early on get your leverage over the narcissist. And I would definitely check out my video on get leverage over the narcissist because you do want to do that early on. So check out my video on that. Number four, they will manipulate evidence, including withholding evidence, certain parts of discovery, and they will start moving money around. They have no scruples. They have no conscience about that. They will definitely do that. Whatever they can get away with, they will do. All right. So that's number four. And by the way, it's so time to slay the narc, right? I mean, slay is my, my program that strategy leverage, anticipate, focus on you. It is so time to slay the narc. And if you agree with me, put slay in the comments right now, slay, slay the narc. Okay. Number five, they will use the court system as their sword. What do, what do I mean by that? File ridiculous motions, file pleadings, use the court system to get at you just to make your life miserable. So they use that as another way of getting supply for themselves. So whatever supply they were getting from you during the relationship, they're now going to trade that by getting supply by just making you miserable now. And they use the court system as their sword, as a way of getting supply. So filing motions, filing false motions, sometimes just filing whatever crap pleadings they can come up with, they will definitely do. So that's number five. Number six, number six is the last one. And you definitely see this a lot with covert narcissists for sure, but all narcissists do this. They line up their flying monkeys. They line up their flying monkeys against you. This is the discard phase is where you definitely see the birth of the smear campaign. They will line up those flying monkeys against you, including the children if they can. Really sad. But if they can, they'll start using the children and trying to get them to be 
on their side against you. So they'll say things you know, against you, but especially, you know, other people as well. I mean, they've really started to plant those seeds early on, maybe even months ago against you. Oh, you know, so-and-so has a drinking problem or, oh, so-and-so is so irresponsible with the kids or something like that. I mean, they've maybe started to say things against you a long time ago if they knew that kind of this was brewing and coming. So anyway, lining up those people against you to make it look like they're wonderful and you're the bad one. That's what they will do. It's a form of bullying. So anyway, those are six things to look out for when you are in a court battle with a narcissist. So let's talk about whether or not you should use the word narcissist in court. The short answer is probably not. There could be times that you could use the word narcissist in court, but for the most part, what you want to do is use the information that you have to prove that the person is not necessarily a good person. And here's why. When you're dealing with judges, you are dealing with a judge who probably has hundreds of cases on their docket, literally hundreds. I know in most counties and most jurisdictions, there are hundreds of cases of divorce cases, new cases filed a day, every single day. And just think about how many family law judges are on the bench in your particular jurisdiction. It might be one, it might be 20, but even if it's you know, 30, and, and there are hundreds or thousands of cases filed a day, those cases are being assigned to those judges on a daily basis. And so those judges are having to deal with thousands of people getting a divorce, thousands. And those cases don't even count the cases where people come back to enforce issues where there might have been a problem before. Somebody's not paying something they're supposed to pay. Somebody's not uh, uh, obeying the, the terms of the agreement or, or, or going along with the terms of the agreement. Or, it, and it doesn't also include any of those um, uh, modification actions. So people who are going back to try to change the parenting plan or try to change the child support or try to change the amount of alimony or anything like that. So enforcement and modifications are not even included in that number that I'm telling you of hundreds or thousands of new divorce cases. So the judges literally are overwhelmed, backed up. They have way too much on their plate, way too many docket, uh, uh, cases on their docket. And judges, by the way, are um, evaluated. They're evaluated by the judicial system and they're also evaluated by the voters who voted them in if, if they were voted in in the first place and not appointed by a, uh, a governor or something like that. But they're still going to be evaluated. They're going to be evaluated on how quickly they get um, cases off of their docket and also how many times they are appealed. So just I give you all of that background because I want you to understand that for those of you who have children, you understand that when your kids, if you have more than one kid and they are fighting with each other and they come at you and they go, he did it, this, he did this to me, she did that to me, she started it, he started it. What's your first reaction going to be? Your first reaction is going to be, both of you just stop it. Both of you just get along, just get along. And so most judges, they just don't want to have to deal with it. They hear finger pointing, they see finger pointing, they hear complaints about spouses on a daily basis all the time, and they're like over it. They just want the case off their docket. And remember, when you do get to go to court, you're going to have a very short window of time to present your case, to look like the, the good one, to be the one that the judge potentially likes better. Remember, judges do apply the law, but they are human beings underneath those black robes. They have biases. They decide they like someone. They decide they believe someone, whatever it is. You get a very short window of time. 
to present your case. And a lot of times people will say to me, I have 50 witnesses that'll show that this person is a bad person. Okay, well, but when you think about that in terms of a realistic presentation to the court, you have to remember that in order to present a witness to the court, you have to have time on that judge's docket. And hours and hours and hours of time on the judge's docket translate to, uh, translates to hours and hours and hours of money and fees that you're spending for your attorney. And if you put 50 witnesses on your witness list, then the other side is gonna to wanna to depose every single one of those witnesses. So when it comes to you know, going in front of a judge and saying, that person's a narcissist, the better way to do it, the judge is just gonna go, okay, they're all narcissists, everybody's a narcissist. That's basically what they're gonna think. So what you need to do is put it in light of something that the judge is actually going to care about, such as custody. If you know the judge has the um, uh, obligation to come up with what's in the best interest of the children, what's gonna be the best parenting plan, what's gonna be the best custody arrangement, who should have decision-making authority about the children's issues or something like that. And so when they're looking at those things, they're going to go, Okay, um, you know, has this person put the children's needs before their own? Has the person encouraged a relationship between the children and the other parent? Has this person been respectful to the other parent? I'm sure in wherever you live, wherever you are in the world, there is some law around how the judge is going to figure out what's going to be best for the children. So it's gonna be better for you to take a look at those laws, whatever they are, and present evidence in light of those laws that shows that this person is not necessarily a good parent. And you can do that without just saying that person's a narcissist. Now, if you wanna say that person's a narcissist and you, you really want that word to be presented to the judge, then it's gonna be better served to do it in the context of either a psychological evaluation or a custody evaluation that's done by a psychological professional or mental health professional who then says, I did psychological testing on these parents and here are the results that I found. And it's gonna be in the context of a full-on report that's probably gonna be 30 or 40 pages and it's gonna to have tons and tons of information and supporting documentation as to how that mental health professional came up with that diagnosis of that person. But even so, remember that narcissism is not illegal and it is not grounds for taking children away from parents. I mean, I know it feels like it should because they're heinous beasts, but the better way for you to attack using the word narcissist or showing narcissistic traits in court is showing why the judge should care about this person's bad traits. So whether it's in the context of you know, property division or maybe it's in the context of showing that they're, they have you know, bad moral character because they lie all the time. You know, lying is always going to be something that's relevant or, or something within the context of the custody case. That's where you're going to want to use that information that you have about how that person is a narcissist. Okay, so I want to get into the judicial system I have a huge community and a lot of people say the judicial system is broken. Um, it, it favors narcissists. Uh, what would you say about that? I don't think the judicial system favors narcissists any more than any other system that the narcissist engages in. In other words, they take no prisoners and they don't back down and, um, a certain amount of fight will behoove you or inure to your benefit no matter what system you're in. 
the system is designed to level the playing field that everybody should have the same rights it's supposed to be you know the the young lady with the balance and the and and and, and the and uh you know blinded to who's before them simply it should be the issues and right or wrong but narcissists can bully anybody and judges can be bullied too they're just people but i think they try very hard first of all they won't know he's a narcissist off the bat you or she he or she, that's right. He or she is a narcissist off the bat. So they have to learn that and figure it out. So uh, it takes time. You, The person who comes in already knows, but the judge doesn't know. So it takes some time to figure that out. And don't get in the habit of trying to one-up the narcissist before the judge and the outrage, because judges will, in the beginning, if they could, if they see it, they, they can take it into account in, in what they say and what they hear and what they believe and, 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 and who has the more rational sense about them. So rationality should will out in most circumstance. It won't seem that way in the beginning because the judge needs run up time. Yeah, I mean, I tell people all the time that the, the court system is beleaguered in a lot of ways. Oh. I mean, judges have way too many cases on their dockets and they, and I tell people that they do get evaluated on how often they get appealed uh, and, and what the res re result is of the appeal if they, right. if they get reversed. And they also are evaluated on how quickly they move cases off their dockets. Right. And so I think that judges feel a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, would you agree with me on that? Oh, absolutely. And, and the system, to that extent, the system is broken. And I think that we as a society has asked the judicial system to uh, fix a lot of things that what it wasn't designed to fix. You have waves of social ills and these waves of divorce and stuff. And we, we are, the system wasn't designed for that. It was designed for the peculiar, odd thing. And now everybody's running the court all the time. So uh, yes, yeah. it is an overwhelmed system. No yeah, more. yeah. I mean, you know, depending on whatever the filing fee is, $400 or whatever, my husband always says, anybody can file anything if they have $400 burning a hole in their pocket. And they do. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> I mean, and the other thing that it, it is that I'd love for you to speak on is I talk often about the difference between divorce law and divorce justice, right. you know, and, and that is, you know, judges are tasked to apply the law that's their job that's your job they're not tasked to you know punish somebody because they cheated because you know they left the other person or something like that can you talk more about that i'm i'm, I'm going to say something about my bias i think the legislator punted a little bit uh especially in, in community property states where and that's not our job to say who was right and who was wrong some states have gotten the idea of uh, marital misconduct, which I'm sure you know about uh, when, you know, I've spent all my, my money on my, my mistress. And so that won't be, you know, so, so you can make some accountability for bad behavior. But for the most part, the justice system is not interested. It is no fault. And it is simply an unwinding of economics and, and property, and it is unrelated to the conduct that caused the, the crisis in the first place. So you have to get next to that in the very, very beginning, especially if you've been dumped upon in the process of the marriage. Totally, totally. I mean, I will say, and I would love to get your opinion on this too, I, and I tell people all the time that no fault simply doesn't, it, it, it means that you don't have to prove fault in order to get a divorce, right? right? So, but, but it doesn't mean fault never matters. I mean, I, and I tell people that judges are humans. And so if you shock the judicial conscience, uh, <laughs> you know, you can, the, the judges can develop a bias yeah. um, because they're making decisions about who's, who, who to believe or not. Can you wow. talk more about that? Yeah, it, it, we are making decisions about who to believe. And I will, I, I, will, I will cop to another concern that I have about the system is I think judges need to be better trained to, to uh, separate themselves from their own emotionality. Uh, you know, it's like 
I was 34 years old when I took the bench. They gave me a robe and set me in the chair and said, good luck to you, sweetie. And um, I learned throughout the time there that I had to separate how I felt about something because it may be a function of something that's happened to me personally. Because as like I think Benjamin Cardozo said, it's like the, 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 the waves of emotion don't just get up and, 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 and pass the judges by. We do feel things and we have to be able to separate how we feel and how what we are seeing makes us feel from what we are really doing, what we really need to do. Yeah, it, it, and you know, but it's not always easy, right? Because you're- Oh, it's never crazy. easy. Yeah, because your emotions are so close to you and you feel far faster than you think. And if you are, it, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to, to eradicate your emotional response to everything. But I think that given better training, I think the police and judges, uh, we can deal with our emotional biases, prejudices, fears in order so we don't pass them along or, or we don't see them through the prism of those, of those peculiarities or uh, peccadilloes. Yeah. So a lot of people are concerned that the narcissist is going to lie to the judge over and over again. And I've seen them lie. Right. Um, and I've seen them get away with their lies. Right. Um, and, you know, there have been times when I've seen them say one thing and, and then 20 minutes later on the stand say something different. And yet the judge ruled for them. I mean, as a lawyer, it can be very frustrating myself. Very. Well, you know, and I think, did you not just notice the inconsistency over there? Like what's going on? But a lot of people are concerned. And so I would love for you to weigh in on what advice you would give to people who are going, I feel like I can never win because they're just going to lie. Um, hopefully most judges will, ca- you know, because you, if, especially if you lie early and we catch you. And uh-huh, we, we don't, you know, it, it, it diminishes the trust we have in you all together once we caught in a lie. So the calm and continued uh, exposition of what is going on by the attorney. And sometimes it, it, you got to remember, it took you a minute to figure out that he was, he or she was a narcissist to begin with. And it's going to take the judge a minute as well. Oh, that's so true. That's a really you good point. I'm saying? You, when you met, you met him and married him. Yeah, it's so true. What a really good point. That is such a good point. Um, you know, and what I tell people to do is, you know, create summaries of their lies and inconsistent statements, you know, like have a text message that says this on one day and another thing that says this. And it makes it easy for the judge to go, oh, okay, I can see the story here. Right. You know, so would you agree with that? That's how oh, absolutely consistent papering. Of, of what is occurring and to put it in because you 20 minutes on my docket today. So if you put it in, if it's just all over the place, I can't get there with you. But if it's concrete for me, I can get there. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. And so, okay. So here's another question that I get a lot. Um, people think if the judge, they've been in front of the judge a couple of times, maybe it's been on a discovery motion, or maybe it's been on a motion to compel or a motion to enforce an order or something like that. And the judge has ruled against them. So now they think that the judge is favoring the narcissist, that they're, they, they're biased, they, they want to get rid of the judge or whatever. What, what would you say to that? Always talk to your attorney first because there's a lot of reasons you can lose emotion and not necessarily be a function of a factual determination made uh, in favor of the narcissist and against you. There could be legal reasons why it is. And so really talk to your attorney and talk to your attorney with the, uh, with the understanding that you're trying to determine what it was that made the motion unsuccessful on your part because you'll go first to the thing that bothers you the most which is their narcissism narcissism but you have to be able to really understand sometimes you lose emotion because of the legal uh particulars of it and sometimes it's because of the lie the narcissist told but in order not to get consumed by that you have to really listen to your attorney and come to their attorney with a clear head about I'm going to accept what she or he or she is telling me about the reasons that our motions were denied 
or uh, granted. And it's not always the end of the story either. Nope. I mean, because, you know, as, as you go in front of the judge more and more, oftentimes it gets turned around. Oftentimes mm-hmm. the judge- Patterns emerge. <laughs> Say it again. Patterns emerge. Exactly, exactly. And the judge starts to see, but it's, it's really hard. And, and I, I want you to speak to this as well, which is, you know, if, if somebody just comes in and says that person is a narcissist, what would you say to that? I, you know, I need evidence. I don't need conclusions. And I think that some people do come up with that person's a narcissist and they may, may be, they could be a jerk or a fool. You know, they're, they're, they're different levels of jerkdom. And, ju- you know, you not necessarily uh, diagnosable just because you're some level of a jerk. So don't come in screaming the 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 concern of the day i'm not the narcissism isn't the concern of the day but it's it's the new uh, it's the word du jour yeah it it, it really is saying it and so and and what i tell people is that you know it's it's almost like two kids fighting you know like if you're a parent and both kids come in she started it no she started it no she's the jerk no he's the jerk but the judge is just like oh both of you stop it <laughs> I, yeah so don't come in here saying making diagnoses because you know don't come in crazy come in calm with me if you come in all wild and out with all of the extremities you know you have to you got to come in cool because I will listen longer and harder. And oh, and if, okay. if you're normally a rational and calm person and there's some exaltation later on, I will I will see it more as a circumstance that is that arose as a function of events as opposed to as opposed to tag you with hysterical, crazy dude or chick. So a lot of my people, um, my followers, viewers, listeners, subscribers, they're dealing with divorce or they're dealing with divorcing specifically a high conflict personality or a narcissist or somebody like that. And so, you know, one of the things I talk a lot about is that the personality that is often targeted or or victimized by a narcissist is usually an empathic person, but also a person who has their own sort of wounds, like maybe they deserve to be treated poorly or they deserve, you know, they they maybe had, had a narcissistic parent or something like that. So how does that person who just feels beat up beat up by the world, beat up by the person in their life. Um, like they can never win. They can never turn it around. They can't get out. There's no way out. Yeah. How did they start making these shifts in their self-talk and, and in yeah. their ontology? Well, I mean, my approach to it is not going to be like the way a lot of people would approach it because ultimately all I'm interested is in freedom. Like, can you get free? Can you get on the other side of something. Now, are you talking about physical freedom or, all of or it, mental all of freedom? I'm talking about like, I'm like, I mean, we say stuff like I should let something go, right? I mean, everybody says it. Well, you'll have to get over it. Sometimes people will say, yeah, but how do you do it? <laughs> like, how do I actually get over it? How do I actually get free of something? Right. right? And so, when often when we're in situations like, for instance, say a, a dysfunctional marriage or a dysfunctional relationship, right? Um, the, the, however you're framing that for yourself is how it will live on with you. So you don't, you don't get to say, oh, that was traumatic and I got that, 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 and then free of that. You're, go, you're now going to carry that around with whatever language you've used to hold it for yourself. Right. And that's true of all of us for all of our past. Your past lives on in the kind of language you've used to capture it. Mm -hmm. So it lives on in your thoughts and that selection of words and phrases that you've used to capture it for yourself. Yeah. And and in a way, that's the only way it lives on because it's not here anymore. It's gone. That's really powerful. That's a powerful place to start, by the way, what you just said there, like really powerful. Like it only lives on in language. Now, in language though, you have an emotional attachment to language. So that is, 
and the speaking of something, both to yourself and others, your emotions will rise and fall and the language you use, right? So for some people, they'll say, oh, this has been the worst day of my life. And it might not have been, right? It might've just been a tough day. But in the language, you'll have an emotional state or as I just called it, a way of being that matches that language. So it's, it would do one, the first step I would say to somebody is you got to get really present to really check in with what's the language I'm using to talk about this. And is it empowering me? Not, not like, cause sometimes people think, well, yeah, it makes me kind of, yeah, screw them. And that, that, that's not power, right? That's more like kind of resentment. Power is when you can say, I've released myself from that. I'm no longer, I'm no longer attached to that. That's power. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then, so then you really got to look at well, what's the language I'm using and what's the language I could use, right. That would allow me to kind of put that in a better spot for myself such that I can move on. Now it's not, it seems like, um, sometimes people think this is just semantics, but absolutely your past lives on in the language you use to describe it. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's how it lives on in your life. So you got to be careful for two things. One, you might have been victimized, but it's, it's incumbent upon you to make sure you don't become a victim like a way of being. Or continue right? to be. Right. You got to, like, I might have been victimized about something. That's okay. But that does not diminish who I am as a human being. Right. right? And, and at the same time, like, from that moment on, when you have those moments where you want to kind of look back or you want to just blame or you want to just be, because that won't serve you, by the way, in terms of fulfilling on a brilliant future for yourself. You can't keep looking back and like they did and they did and I should have and that, that, that. None of that will serve you, right? That'll just grind it on and grind it on and grind it on for you. But rather than starting to put it in perspective for yourself and a place that empowers you, it's got to empower you, right? And, and, don't, and one of the worst things I think, you can, in my experience, I think you can do is turn yourself into the triumphant victim. Because it still lives on. It's I still, love that triumphant victim, right. or, or even triumphant, you know, survivor. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, use a different word for victim. Right. 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 Like, what, what point do I say I'm over it? You know. Yeah. And, and and that really is what you're looking for. You're looking to get to the point where you can look at that time in your life, and there's no attachment for you. Like you don't experience anything in terms of like negativity, but. Yeah. So that's why it's important for you to come to terms with the truth. It's important for you to tell the truth to yourself and be straight with yourself about it. And then don't give yourself permission to use it to justify your future self. So you can't give yourself permission to like, oh yeah, well that happened. So now I'm off the hook for, it. no, you can't do that because that way it's still living on for you. Well, I th the thing is though, I think that for some people, I mean, for some people I know who are listening, they're going to be going, but I'm still in it. He's still victimizing me or she's still victimizing me. They're still yeah. treating me this way. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it, it's hard sometimes to, you know, get past the gunfire when the, the guns are still aiming at you. Right. So, you know, but at the same time, you got to realize like, so if you're, if you go into Starbucks, for instance, it always smells like coffee, right? There's no time you go in there and you're like, oh, it smells like an oil refinery in here. It always smells like coffee and discourse and upset and divorce more often than not. It's not a good smell. You got to just come to terms with this is how this is. Now, you know, one of the things that actually kind of put me on the map a long time ago is a statement that I made online. I said, you have the life that you're willing to put up with, right? Now, that seems kind of harsh. And I know it seems harsh to people, right? But that's our big problem as human beings. It's, it's, it's our willingness to tolerate certain things in our lives, including ourselves, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like I tolerate myself. I tolerate no voice. I tolerate that about me. Now, that's ultimately what what'll, you'll be burdened by. Whatever you're tolerating about yourself, you'll be burdened by that. You'll find a way for that to get expressed in life. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I say to people, look, 
I, I had a, this was a long time ago. I actually had a client. The guy said, you know, he was going through a divorce and it was very, very messy with him and his, his former wife. And then eventually I just said to him, what do you want? Do you want a fair divorce or do you want a divorce? And he said, well, I want a fair divorce. I said, okay, well, we're going to be here a while and that's fine. I just want you to know, like, that's how it's going to go. Which went on for a few more months and he just said, I just want a divorce. And they divorced within, I think, four weeks. Emily, what's the best way to continue to keep my narcissistic abuser away from my kids. As of right now, he has no visitation, but I'm concerned if he ever decides to file. So Emily, I definitely have videos on this, on how to protect your child from a narcissistic parent uh, and things like that. So what I would suggest that you do is, um, is uh, check, out, check out that video. It'll, it'll be much more in depth than what I can give you as a quick answer here. But in general, definitely keep documentation of everything. Um, ask for a custody evaluation. If you think that there's really a problem, um, you know, if, if you think that your children are in danger, then you may want to um, check with your lawyer or the um, authorities in your state about potentially getting uh, some sort of a protective order that protects the children, um, you know, psych evals, things like that. Um, definitely therapy for the children um, and, and just, um, you know, making sure that the court is aware of what's going on at every turn. So keeping really super um, detailed document uh, documentation you know, have the notes section open on your phone, you know, exactly what's been going on, that sort of thing. So um, if he has no visitation now, more than likely, um, you know, there's going to be maybe some sort of a step up plan, like, um, you know, supervised time sharing first. And then if, if, if the, um, if everything is satisfied with the super time, supervised time sharing, then maybe they graduate to like, dinner once a week that's not supervised or maybe a couple of hours on a Saturday morning that's not supervised, like no overnights right away. And then if that goes well, then maybe they graduate to having like one overnight a week. Normally they don't literally go from no, no super, no, no time sharing at all, all the way to like a 50, 50. I mean, that very rarely happens because it's like kind of shocking for the kids too to figure out what's going on with all of that. So Okay, next. I'm going to keep on going until uh, for a couple of more minutes here. Let's see. Um, what's the next question? Um, I see somebody from North Carolina. I love to see, I love to see where you guys are, are um, calling in from. So let me know where you all are um, calling in from. This is super cool. So... Let's see, I just wanna go back and see what the next question is. Um, inheritance, only child put over everything at hospital, step siblings, because friends with funeral, they stole my inheritance. That's more of an estate planning question um, and, and not, I mean, um, that's it's something to put to like a wills and trust lawyer, not not necessarily me. I don't really get into inheritances unless, you know, it was some kind of inheritance that somebody received during the marriage and they kept it separate or, or they commingled it or something like that. So I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer your question, Brandy, but definitely um, talk to an attorney in your state. Um, who, who deals with that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Next one. I hit a large sum of cash. She found it, took it after getting into marital home. This has been my primary residence. Is there anything I can do as it wasn't disclosed? Uh, I would say that if it was marital, then, you know, it was probably going to be divided equally and just make sure that it all goes onto the spreadsheet. If you didn't disclose it, then that's probably going to be an issue 
anyway uh, in your particular state or jurisdiction because most states, all the ones that I know of, they require full disclosure and there could be ramifications after the final judgment is entered if there wasn't full disclosure and assets were found afterwards. There could be a fraud claim or something like that in your particular state. So um, I'd be really careful about that kind of thing. So let's talk about Kim and Kanye. So they reportedly have a prenuptial agreement in place and they're worth a combined 2.1 billion. Yes, that's billion with a B. So is this divorce going to get super messy? But what about the prenup? I mean, if the prenup is, is in place, then how could it be messy, right? Well, here's the thing. The prenuptial agreement will probably only address the finances. So with regard to the assets and the income, anything like that, yes, it will definitely be not messy, if, assuming that nobody is challenging the terms of the prenup. But the kids, that's where there's going to be a rub because you cannot pre-contract for anything with regard to the children. In other words, you can't say, you know, six or eight years ago or 10 years ago or whatever, you know, in this particular instance, they were married seven years ago, but, um, you know, you can't say, here's what's going to happen with the children 10 years from now, because you're not going to know what is going to be in the best interest of the children at that time. So it is against public policy to pre-contract for anything with regard to the children. And the courts have the final say as to what's in the best interest of the children, not even the parents, because sometimes the parents don't even come up with the best agreements. Most of the time, courts end up just rubber stamping whatever parents come up with as far as an agreement, but sometimes they don't. And especially when people challenge that. So if there's even anything with regard to the children in their prenuptial agreement, it will mo most likely be found void and unenforceable as against public policy. That means that the whole situation up with the children is up for grabs. So potentially there could be a major messy battle with regard to the children. So the second question I've been asked on this is that Kim cited irreconcilable differences and is seeking joint and physical custody. So what does this say about her intentions and does this signal that she wants it to be amicable? So First of all, irreconcilable differences really only means that she just wants a divorce. It just is the terminology that is used nowadays to get a no-fault divorce. So you can use irreconcilable differences. You can say irretrievably broken. It just depends on the language in your particular state, but it just means that you just want your no-fault divorce, which is what all states offer nowadays. So that's the first part of it. But with regard to seeking joint and physical legal custody of the children, it might just mean that she wants him to still be a part of their lives, that she's recognizing that it's important that they have a father, uh, that sort of thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to end up fighting over the, what the actual schedule is going to be and what the actual um, parental responsibility is going to be. So in other words, she might say, I want ultimate decision-making authority around um, medical or educational or something like that. And especially given the fact that he's had mental health issues in the past, it's been very public. He's had meltdowns on Twitter. She's even come out and talked about his mental health issues and said that it's a complicated issue and that he struggles with it. So with all of that lying in the balance, I'm thinking that there may end up being some sort of an issue around the custody matters. So the third question that I'm being asked around this is, could Kanye West's mental health issues play a role in his ability to see the kids and have custody since he's been open about his bipolar disorder and he has talked about it publicly? Okay, so 
With that being said, having a mental health disorder, such as bipolar disorder or something like that, doesn't necessarily preclude anyone from having their children and being good parents. People have an inherent right to be parents to their children. There's a constitutional right to have your, your children and be parents to your children. So all of that being said, it doesn't mean that just because you have a mental health disorder that you aren't allowed to have your children. Of course not. There are many people out there who have mental health issues and they are really, really great parents. The rub is actually going to be in whether or not he is getting the help and the therapy that he actually needs. So is he taking the medications that he's supposed to be taking? Is he getting the therapy that he potentially is going to be needing in order to be stable and be able to show up for his children and be a good parent. So there may be some checks and balances in that process. Maybe it's supervised time sharing unless he complies with certain things. Maybe it's uh, a, a certain amount of time sharing for a little while. And then it, he works up to something a little bit more depending on how he behaves and things like that. But, you know, the overall thing is he'll still have rights to be a parent to his children. He'll still have rights to get access to medical records, access to educational records, be able to come to the school place, be able to show up at, you know, soccer games and things like that. But it, he won't necessarily get... 50-50 time sharing, fully unfettered, if he is not stable and he's not doing what he needs to do to keep himself mentally healthy. And if you definitely saw this divorce coming, give me an I saw it coming in the comments below. So the next question that I've received is they haven't listed their separate properties and assets, but Kim reportedly noted in her petition that pursuant to the party's pre, uh, premarital agreement, all assets and obligations of each party are his or her own separate property. And she also asked the court that each of them pay their own attorney's fees. So what does this mean? So this means that they probably have kept their assets pretty separate throughout the marriage. And the prenuptial agreement probably says something like anything that's jointly owned will be uh, split jointly and, and, and divided equally. But my guess is maybe they haven't even titled anything jointly. And if they do have anything that they've purchased jointly, they've already figured out who's getting what or something like that. So more than likely, the financial piece of this thing will just shake out very, very easily. As far as the attorney's fees piece, she probably just pleaded that because it's required. The five main areas of a divorce are your assets and liabilities, your alimony or support issues, uh, parenting plans, child support, and attorney's fees. So she probably just pleaded something about that because she had to. And more than likely, the prenuptial agreement has something in there that says, if uh, either party challenges the prenuptial agreement, then uh, the losing party is going to have to pay both sides fees. But in, my, in this particular case, you've got a, two, two people who both have wealth, who both have money. So more than likely, they have the ability to pay their own attorney's fees anyway. So it's not going to be an issue. So the final question is, despite the split reportedly being amicable, is there anything about the divorce between two high profile stars like this that worries a divorce attorney? How can things go wrong? How can things go wrong? Hmm. Every divorce attorney is laughing out loud right now because, of course, every single person, when they walk into a divorce attorney's office, says, I don't want to fight. Everybody says that. Even the flaming narcissists say that because why? Because they don't want to have to spend a lot of money. However, then people start disagreeing. And what I've heard is that Kanye is not so happy about this divorce, that he is stewing, that he is sad, that he is angry, that he is mad. And that means that if he is a narcissist, he may use this divorce process as an opportunity to make her miserable. He might try to thwart the whole process, thwart the settlement uh, process, the mediation, the negotiation talks by trying to punish her by 
fighting her on the children or fighting her on whatever he wants to fight her on, obstruct things, refuse to disclose things, refuse to come to the table, maybe not show up at mediation. You know the deal. Those of you who follow me here on a regular basis, he is a person and people are prone to do the things that people do, especially when they are narcissists. And the reason why narcissists like to thwart the divorce process is because they have this undying need, this unending need for narcissistic supply. And if you want to know more about narcissistic supply, go check out my video on narcissistic supply. I talk all about that and um, and why they have this unending need for it. So I am concerned about that. I'm also concerned about the fact that maybe he's not regulated right now. If he is not taking the medications that he needs for his bipolar disorder, if he is not seeking the therapy that he may need, it, then he could be volatile. And that process could also make it very, very difficult for her, especially if she's trying to keep it behind closed doors, if she's trying to keep it quiet, if she's trying to make sure that she protects the children. Who knows? They could, they could be both narcissists. And if that's the case, then both of them may be trying to get at the other and try to one up the other. And what happens with narcissists when there's children involved is they don't have the ability to put their children first. And so they often end up fighting and using the children as pawns to try to hurt the other side. And the, the, the losers in that situation are most definitely the children. A forensic audit would be very helpful for my divorce from narc husband who is hiding income. Is it the judge who orders it? If so, what is required to make a case for a judge to order it? That is a really good question. And I really like that question. So the times that you would generally hire a forensic accountant in a divorce would be for three major areas. One is for if you have a valuation issue, like you need to value a business that somebody owns or maybe a portion of a business or a share of a business or something like that. That's one main reason. The next main reason might be for a lifestyle analysis. So uh, somebody is wanting alimony or some sort of spousal support lifestyle is an area that people can look at, the judge can look at in your particular state, country, or jurisdiction. You know, how much money did you spend on your lifestyle throughout the course of the marriage? Uh, so, so that's a second area that they can look at. And the third area is the income issue, which is what you're asking me about, Athena. And um, the times where you really want to look at what somebody's true income is, is when it's not readily obvious when it's not super easy to do. And the only time it's really super easy to do is if somebody is like a, a, an employee, a W-2 employee, and they only get paid from one source and it's from some company that they don't own and they get a W-2 at the end of the year and that's their income. And so that it's, and you can look at their pay stubs and, and all that is like really, really readily available. If you have a situation like that, you don't need a forensic to help you with income. If you have a situation though, where the income is not readily obvious and the easiest one with that is if somebody owns their own business or they're in some sort of a business where they get paid partially in cash or something like that then it's harder, especially if they own their own business though, because if they own their own business, it's possible that they are writing off a lot of expenses that maybe are allowed to be written off according to the IRS, but from a divorce standpoint, some of those expenses that may be allowed to be written off you know, by the IRS can be added back in in the divorce. So for example, a good example of that is like maybe your car payments. So maybe all or a portion of your car payments can be deducted from income, especially if it's a, a, a S corporation. And then it, that takes off income that would flow through to your personal tax return. 
So that kind of income can be added back in when you're trying to find out what somebody's true income is in a divorce. And the income comes into play in really three major areas in a divorce. It's the spousal support, child support, and also any claims for attorney's fees. So it, it, it is really, really important to figure out what somebody's true income is. So if you engage an a forensic accountant, then you can do that. Now, if, if you want to engage a forensic accountant, you can just engage a forensic accountant. And then you would ask the judge or I mean, you would ask the other side through response, a request for, to produce or something like that for the financial documents. You are entitled to them. So you don't need to have the judge order a forensic accountant to be appointed unless you want that forensic accountant to be a neutral third party. But you know, I think you just want to hire your own and, and then you just ask the other side for the financial documents that you want or that you're going to need. Usually what I do as the lawyer is I ask the forensic accountant, give me a list of the documents that you need. And then I turn it into a formal request to produce and I send it over to the other side. At that point, the other side does have the, um, the option to, you know, object to those requests if they want to. But if they object to the requests, then you're going to set those objections for hearing and you're going to go in front of the judge and you're going to say, I need, I need those documents because we're trying to figure out what his true income is. And the judge is going to say, well, income is certainly relevant in this case. So I'm going to order the other side to go ahead and give the documents. And if, if that's what happens, then at that point, you're going to ask for attorney's fees because you had to go through that whole exercise. So basically, once you uh, when during a divorce, either side can ask for all kinds of financial documents and information, and then they have to produce it unless they want to object to it. Uh, and if they object to it, they better have a darn good reason because you are entitled to have full financial disclosure and, and you should have full financial disclosure before you go in front of uh, you know, a mediator or try to do any kind of dispute resolution in the case. You, you will want to make sure that you have all the information that you need. So let me talk just also for a minute about hiding income as far as like people who get paid in cash. It's, you know, very hard to track. So sometimes the way that we track that is through a, what we call like a reverse lifestyle analysis, which is how much has been being spent on things. In other words, they, this couple could not have had this lifestyle unless there was money coming in from somewhere. You know, I've, I've seen people where on paper, they look like they make $25,000 a year, but they're, they live in a million dollar house and their kids go to private school and they both drive luxury vehicles. And OK, so where's the money coming from? So you can do like what we call a reverse lifestyle analysis if you think somebody is hiding income as well. Um, that, that, that's another way that you can do it. The other way is um, like if somebody is let's say they own a restaurant or something like that and a lot of people pay in cash and this is the most expensive way is you actually have an auditor go sit in the restaurant from, you know, open till close for like a full week and watch every single transaction that goes through that place. Um, that is extremely expensive to do. I don't recommend it unless there's lots and lots of money that needs to be, um, counted. And at that point, you would need a court order to allow that to happen. Otherwise, you can't just have somebody go sit in somebody's business for a week or whatever. Um, so you would need a court order to allow that to happen. So um, I, that's a really, really good question from Athena. And I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure that I addressed that in a lot of different ways, because you know, it, when you are dealing with narcissists, there's oftentimes a problem with 
hiding money or using money to control the other side. So, um, you know, I, I did a, uh, a, a survey in my Facebook group and it turned out that money was like the number one way that narcissists used to control their um, soon to be ex-spouses. So it is a really, really important topic. And because income does impact so many things, it impacts so much of the divorce process, it really is important to get a handle on what somebody's true income is. So, um, and by the way, there's one other little secret that I want to give you guys when it comes to uh, looking at somebody's true income, even if they are a W-2 employee, you will want to potentially subpoena their, their pay records from the company and ask the company to give you the information as to where the pay has been directed, maybe over the last couple of years, what accounts, account numbers, routing numbers, all that sort of thing. So that that way you can see if any money has been directed somewhere else, you know, like a bonus or something like that. Um, that's a really, really um, like kind of a, a tricky thing that nobody else has really ever um, seen before. How soon after your divorce should you implement a temporary parenting plan? And that question is from Heather. So Heather, thank you for your uh, question. So the first thing I do need to say and make sure that I always say is that uh, I am, you know, I'm only licensed as an attorney in Florida. And so when I give you my advice, it is not legal advice for actual legal advice that it pertains to the laws in your state or your country. You should con um, connect with an attorney there in your jurisdiction. But I can tell you generally and give you general information. So with regard to a temporary parenting plan, that's something that you should probably do, especially if you're dealing with a narcissist on the other side, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, I actually had a case one time where the husband had filed for divorce when the wife, who the wife was my client, and he filed for divorce when she was like seven and a half months pregnant. So what we ended up doing was mediating a temporary parenting plan like a week or two before she gave birth to the baby. And that temporary parenting plan is still actually in place and still going because the case is still going. We are actually getting ready to mediate that case again for the final parenting plan at the end of August. But for the whole first year of the baby's life, the, the temporary parenting plan has remained in place. And for, for my client's sake, she has been really happy about that because it didn't give any overnights to the husband. So she has been able to have almost total control of the child for the whole, ba the baby's almost first year. So I would recommend that you enter into a temporary parenting plan as soon as you can, because then there's less problem, less chance for interaction, less chance for man manipulation. I would highly recommend that the parenting plan be as specific as possible, which means, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays from this time to this time, there with you know the mother Wednesdays and Thursdays from this time to this time you know whatever it is have it be super super specific and even down to the detail of who's driving the children to where uh, it, it, you know it, is the person who's receiving the children driving to pick them up is the person who's giving up the children for the next two days taking them somewhere and. And, and even specify where the exchanges are going to take place. You know, a lot of times before COVID hit, we would say school, you know, like the kids would be dropped off at school in the morning and then the other parent would pick them up in the afternoon. But with COVID, things are a lot more different. So, you know, make sure that you have that in place. And I would recommend that you at least include the major holidays that are going to be coming up in the next several months, because while you can certainly settle your case sooner, and hopefully you do, if you think that it, it that there's any chance that a major holiday is going to happen 
before your case is over, it just makes it easier than having to go back to lawyers and try to go back and forth and try to figure out what's going to happen at Christmas or Hanukkah or, you know, some special holiday that really means a lot to the families. So I do recommend that you implement that temporary parenting plan as soon as possible. And sometimes I even say before you even move out, have that written parenting plan in place because otherwise it just it causes havoc. And I would include in the temporary parenting plan that it is temporary, that it's not to be used for as a basis for any sort of final parenting plan. And I would include in there some kind of language about if, if one person doesn't do what they say they're going to do, that, um, that the defaulting party or the non-complying party has, uh, is the one that has to pay both sides fees so that there's some sort of incentive to actually do the parenting plan, that there's something that happens if, if the parenting plan isn't um, it, you know, uh, adhered to by, by both parents. Um, and you might want to put something in there about using a, an app, like a, a, some sort of like um, Talking Parents or FAIR or Our Family Wizard or Co-Parenter. There are several apps out there. And I would suggest that you put that in the temporary agreement as well. A lot of jurisdictions do recommend that you mediate a temporary parenting plan almost Immediately after the, the divorce is filed, some jurisdictions say it has to be in place within 30 days or something like that. So some jurisdictions actually, actually require you to enter into a temporary parenting plan right away. So um, those are a few of the things that I would include. And, and that's when I would in, um, go ahead and uh, implement that temporary parenting plan.